Junior. 17 August 1887, 10 June 1940, born Jamaica. Marcus Garvey was a Kushak Kindred, African spirit, political activist. The Babylonian chicanery, he would always dismantle, expose, and untwist. He was a publisher, publishing words to relieve his Kushak Kindred under pressure. He was a journalist with intentions of uncovering the truth hidden by the immoral oppressor. He was an entrepreneur and led by example, self-reliant in the Babylonian Big Apple. He was an orator and simply spoke words of fire. He was a cousin kindred that saw that the essence of man laid within the self that every man must be responsible for his own mental, spiritual, and physical health. He was a Kushite kindred that stood firm with courage, a man that understood the rudiments of a man's character. And he was prepared to bleed, prepared to bleed for the sake of his brother and his sister. With fervency, he urged his Kushite kindred to find solace, to stop following and stop behaving like sheep. Rather stand up and take the lead, and then that with your soul you shall surely read. Marcus Garvey wanted to cast out the ongoing immoral oppression. oppression. Liberation was his number one goal. He was a Kushite kindred with the ability to light up and ignite the Kushite kindred soul. The moral oppressor inhibited prevented and blatantly stopped his Kushite kindred from their natural progress. But he knew that the will of man can conquer, destroy, and over any type of wickedness. So he told his Kushite kindred how they once stood tall, supreme, gallant, elegant, and brave, spiritually, mentally, and scientifically advanced, while other nations were living in caves. He wanted his Kushite kindred to regain their sense of grandeur, to want more, demand more, and stop thinking poor, and even the score. Come away from the mentality of servitude. Take strength from deep within, with a big, strong change in attitude. He wanted his Kushite kindred to control their own destiny, come together as one nation to build a strong Kushai kindred nation. To accumulate knowledge with study, to seek education, a gentle touch of nature being the foundation. Many peoples around the world look upon the works of Marcus Garvey as holy and prophetic. He helped millions upon millions of lost Kushite kindred and others that were mentally, physically, and spiritually sick. He made it perfectly clear that Kushite kindred at home and Kushite kindred abroad all have the same mother, father, and most gracious Lord. Marcus Garvey Jr. spoke for all peoples with impartiality. He spoke for the betterment of the whole world community. One God, one aim, one destiny. Yeah, you dance, you dance, you dance, you know? You pray that every Marcus Calvary, you know? If I and I should go on and tell you about Marcus Calvary, you could almost say what the sun doing here. So we can go on and tell you all about Marcus Garvey, as the brother say, unpartial, unjudgmental, just right. Just right over all things. Just right. You know, Garvey have a word to say that if you cannot do what other men have done, you might as well die. How are you? Them sounds like that are easy sounds, you know, to me. That means they must have seen something where I and I don't even buck up on yet. I used to buck up on enough terrible things. But he must have buck up on some terrible things. 
when I walk and I criticize everything when you see. And yet, yet, you cannot do what other man has done. So Marcus says, you can't find a job, go and make one. Simple. If you cannot find one, go and make one. So today, we give thanks and honor. You know, I'm just saying the time is moving on, so you're not going to speak on too far. So, Brother Eddie, Andy, please step forward and give me a round of applause for the chapter part two to be here in the city of God. Thank you, thanks. Give thanks. Good evening. Good evening. Greetings. I feel I want to say, Yeah! Master! Oh, I need to get that off of my chest. Uh, it's been a great honor to be here today, and I don't know what took me so long, but nothing happened before it's time. And what I've experienced today, I don't think I'll ever be able to forget. I know that I've got it, but now I'll let it go. Yeah, I'll let it go. So ladies and gentlemen, my name is Eric Capone, and I'm the chairman of the Marcus Garvey Legacy Trust. And this was inspired by Dr. Garvey. And I thank him for that because I really see a path to which the Marcus Garvey Legacy Trust can play a part in unity, protection of our legacy and heritage, and the promotion of our legacy and heritage to our younger generation, because they are the banner bearers. They are the ones who will shoulder the burden of the future and lead the way. So I'm really looking for friends, not just look like me, but think like me and will act like me as one. And we can do it, and it's not going to be easy, but I have absolute confidence. Now where there's one, there's two. Where there's two, there's three. And together, we'll build an army of warriors. Yeah. So without further ado, we're taking up too much time because we're running out of time. But I just want to tell you something that we're planning in the very near future. And it was something Brother Sean lay on me and it really knocked me to the floor because I started a project which is to celebrate and a tribute to the Imperial Majesty. And what Burashan laid on me made me feel I was one in tune with the universe. And this project is gonna be a fundraiser, ladies and gentlemen, for Fairfield Hall. I would be devastated if this building ever, ever come out of the hands of the community. If you did ever fall into disrepair and have it taken away. It will never happen while I'm alive. And to that, ladies and gentlemen, I can't do it alone. I will need your help. And this tribute to Imperial Majesty is not just a bath thing. 
It's not just an England team. It's a worldwide team. And we have to bring together the diaspora around the world because we're not alone. We're not alone on this island. There are millions of us around the world. And just like Marcus Garvey was able to bring nine million people together, we can also do it for Imperial Majesty, for ourselves, for our children, and for the future. So ladies and gentlemen, what is space? And I made some wonderful friends here today, and I will definitely be relating to them, who will relate to you, because I know you have a tight community here, and together we're going to move forward. And having Dr. Garvey here today, his first presence, my first presence, to this remarkable building. This is a new renaissance. This is definitely a new renaissance. And I'm not somebody who talk, I walk. And if I have to stand alone, so be it. But I have no fear that I'll be alone because you're here, I'm here, we are here. So ladies and gentlemen, I ain't saying no more because I could talk all night. I'm not saying about what I'm about to say, but I'm sure that today we have a hell of a lot more knowledge and experience to which we would like to share with you and all of us. So thank you very much for this opportunity to be here. Thank you very much for welcoming me and Dr. Garvey and my crew. And words can I express what I feel right now. I can't find words because this is so, so moving to me. I am almost trembling. <laughs> So, thank you very much. One of So, good evening. Um, so, this is going to be in conversation with Dr. Julius Garvey. You are going to hear his voice. <laughs> um, it's been an honour and a blessing. If you don't know me, my name's Sean Sobers. I'm a trustee of Fairfield House and a professor at the University of the West of England. And it's been an honour to work with brother Eric Home, Indigo, Alex, and of course Dr. Julius Garvey. So I'm going to go straight into the uh, bio, and then we'll have the conversation, and we can open up for any questions at the end. Um, uh, I think I'll just shorten it. Yeah, yeah. I don't think we need a bio. I'm Marcus Garvey's second son, Julius Garvey. Um, I'm, I'm a retired cardiothoracic and vascular surgeon. Retired about three years ago. Fortunately, just lived before COVID. So I've been sitting on COVID at home and enjoying my retirement. But it's indeed a pleasure to be here uh, with you. And uh, I wasn't sure what I was uh, getting into when, when Eddie penciled this in on, on the tour. Uh, but it's been indeed uh, an eye opener. Um, not, not so much for the baths and baths, we visited the Roman baths, but really um, to see uh, the residents um, of Emperor Hill Selassie uh, when he was here uh, in exile from 1936 to 1941. And then to see all the wonderful work that the community organizers have done over the years, starting out 30 years ago, um, the, the Caribbean community um, building 
uh, from that time until now and then being able to um, uh, occupy this particular residence which the emperor left for the community here. And um, I, I just think they should be congratulated in terms of being able to build the community around you know, such an important uh, uh, residence and around such an important historic figure. And obviously it's also given a home to the Rastafari, um, who we can also call garbage cults, as I heard somebody else uh, uh, mentioned uh, before. So I, I, I feel, you know, uh, very much at, at home um, in terms of the, the vibes that I'm getting and, and, and the message that I've had so far from, from the community uh, are here. And, and uh, you know, uh, certainly we, we know that the kingdom is coming, the kingdom is here. And, and we certainly know that, that our, our conscience is guiding us forward. So we are, we are you know, on the, the right track. And um, this is certainly time, I think, as Eddie has mentioned, for, for all of us to come together. Um, it's, it's been, been a very, very much um, uh, a, a long distance uh, struggle for us as a people coming out of slavery, coming out of colonialism, but still within the belly of the beast, uh, so to speak. So, but uh, we, have to, yes, we, have to, <laughs> we have to keep on keeping on because that, that is the message. And, you know, wickedness cannot survive. Righteousness will, will survive, and righteousness will defeat wickedness. So we can continue to chant the old Babylon. Right, right, right. So thanks so much for being here, and we go to Q and A. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, what brings you back to the UK? You did a previous tour, twenty thirteen. You're back now. You did Liverpool previously, London, and then you've got more next week as well. So what, 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 why did you feel it was important for you to do another speaking tour now in 2022? Well, the, the best time to do anything is now. Actually, you know, that's the only time you have. The past is the past. The future hasn't happened yet, so whatever you're going to do, you have to do it now. But now is an important time in terms of um, the, the transformation of the world. It's a, it's a time of, of chaos. And um, if you look at our history, you'll see that we have always made progress when um, if Europe has been at war. Um, as you know, uh, my father's uh, our movement came to prominence after uh, World War I, which was 1914-1918. And of course, that was when the so-called you know, great powers fought among themselves and destroyed themselves. And so there was a moment for us to move forward. And then uh, again, after World War II, after you know about 75 million people were killed in terms of europe they also brought us into the war but again you see as macmillan said you know the winds have changed subsequently and then throughout the 60s the late 50s, 60s uh we got independence and now we have you know 54 independent african countries 15 independent caribbean countries and now you see that nato has created um, basically a war against the russians and they have surrounded Russia. And um, so now we have the Ukrainian people being used as pawns to fight the war against Russia. And you see that the United States, which is the dominant uh, power in the world, wants to maintain its hegemony. You see that they're antagonizing China. So now you see that the, the, the power struggle is, is going on between NATO, um, uh, which is Europe in that sense. but. Um, uh, the United States is behind NATO. So we're moving then um, and now towards a situation where Europe is going to suffer in terms of the Ukraine-Russia war. Uh, America is going to suffer. We're going to end up with a, a multipolar um, uh, universe instead of a unipolar uh, American hegemony. We, we're going to have basically Russia, you're going to have China, are you going to have India standing on its own, it's not following our NATO or the US? Many African countries are standing on their own, they're refusing to follow Biden, etc. So, hopefully, we'll see what goes on in Brazil, but also um, Lula. If Lula wins, well, Lula is very much a man of the people, so with a major Latin American country, and you know, of course, there's Venezuela, there's Cuba, there are others. So, this is a time of change. And uh, us as a people, 
we have to recognize that we, we, we should not be taking sides. As they say, you know, when elephants fight, the grass suffers. So we don't want to be the grass, and we should not allow ourselves to suffer when the elephants are fighting, but we should take advantage of that opportunity. So I think it's important now for us to understand that message, for us to understand that we need to come together to pursue you know, our own purpose in, in life, which is to free ourselves from the systems that have incarcerated us, because again, globalization is just a, another form of colonization, which is just another form of the enslavement of our people. So we have to understand that. And finally, we, we have to defeat Babylon. We can't pass that on for another generation and another generation. So the time is now, so to speak. That's why I felt important. Marcus Garvey's son, you're also Dr. Julius Garvey, MD. Um, and it's very clear from what you just said that you are Marcus Garvey's son, you know, forthright and powerful or, or, or I also want to get to know you in relation to your father's values, message, and your journey. You were seven years old when Marcus Garvey passed. Um, what do you remember about that time growing up? with a figure such as your father? What do you remember? Because you were young at that point, and yeah, we're going forward, but yeah, what's your earliest memories of your father? Yes, actually, well, when he died, I was age seven, but I was back in Jamaica. Um, he had remained in England to carry on the organizational work. We had come back uh, um, uh, from England because my brother had arthritis in his leg, and we had to come back to a warm climate. So the last time I saw him, actually, I was five years old, not seven. So my memories of him are you know, those of a child, um, you know, just with um, somebody who was very loving, kind, playful, and that, that sort of thing, yeah. but nothing in any sense political. And when did you become aware that your father was Marcus Garvey, you know, politician, activist, journalist, and, yeah. you know? But, well, that's something I think my mother always, you know, taught me in terms of as far as I can remember. But, you know, um, over time, you know, different events, shall we say, uh, happen, and you recognize that, oh, you know, there's something uh, not quite normal about the situation, meaning it's different from what you might expect. First of all, when we came back from England on, on the ship, um, there was an enormous crowd. I was up on the deck with my mother and my brother, an enormous crowd of, of, of people. And, um, you know, I was coming back from England, having spent two years and being accustomed to white people, and said to my mother, what are all these black people doing here? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand. I said, well, they came to see you, to welcome you. I said, well, what? You know, yeah, you're your father's son. So that, again, that was one of the first times, you know, there was a, a large crowd of people, you know, coming to welcome, you know, my dad's family, if you will. So that was one. And then, you know, when, where we used to live, uh, Mountain View Avenue, you know, myself and my brother would be playing, etc. cetera, um, um, you know, uh, on the lawn, and people coming home from work or whatever, they'd stop and, you know, the, the fence would be lined with people watching us. Uh, you know? yeah. So again, you got a sense that, not just that we were important in that sense, but, you know, my dad or my mother, um, they were important. And different incidents like that, I remember being at school, high school, and, um, uh, you know, we, we had free lunches, and I was getting my lunch from the lady who served, and she leaned over and she said, no, you know, your father was a great man, you know, Marcus Scott, you know, that sort of thing. So these things accumulated over time. But the basic person who taught me about my dad was my mother. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your mother, Amy uh, Jax Garvey. Yeah. She was an activist, journalist, you know, and a, a forthright, powerful individual in her own right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she's responsible for a lot of your father's work being published, etc. Yeah. So, yeah, let's hear about your mother and how she's also still found. Yeah, well, she was a very, you know, strong person. Um, she really stood on, on her own uh, uh, two feet uh, individually. So she was a bit of an equal of my dad, and she didn't necessarily give in to him uh, uh, per se. I think she was one of the early feminists, if you will, in terms of um, being able to assert herself. She had a very good education in, in Jamaica. She went to Woolman's Girls School, you know, Woolman. You have those some other schools in, um, in Barbados, but um, so she was very well educated, and she was a legal secretary before she migrated to the States, met my dad at one of the UNIA meetings, and then um, came to, to work uh, with him and for him. 
as his private secretary and then subsequently got married. But um, she was very instrumental in the organization because of her background, because of her education. Uh, so she was able to look after the books of the organization, which were kind of in disarray. They did not, you know, uh, educated personnel necessarily to deal with those problems. And um, she, she ran the woman's page of the Negro world. Um, certainly when my, my dad was um, in prison in, in Atlanta, 1925, 1927, um, she published um, Accumulation of His Words, Philosophy and Opinions, Volume 1 and 2. She did that all on her own and, you know, helped to run the organization during that period of time. And then, of course, when he was deported uh, back to Jamaica in 1927, we all went back, and, you know, um, to board two children, so she was more wife there, um, um, and, and, and mother, um, than being involved with the organization, you know, up front. And, um, but subsequently, um, as I mentioned before, you know, you know my dad moved to, to England. So, um, and then again, we came back to Jamaica. So she ran the organization, the UNIA in Jamaica. She participated in and she participated in politics uh, locally, but she was raising, you know, both of us. We got a very good education. We went to private schools. And then she um, uh, taught a lot of young people who came, young historians and so on, Rupert Lewis, um, uh, and, and others, uh, Tony Martin, uh, that, that came to find out the inner working, so to speak, of the Gaza movement, you know, from my, from the horse's mouth, if you will. So she was very, very active then, you know, as an educator, uh, continuing the organization, and as mother raising uh, two children. Can I get appreciation for Amy Jacks Garvey? <laughs> of Marcus and Sai Garvey is also to hail up the women in the movement as well, as men in um, So you lived in London for a couple of years, what's the score here? Have you got any memories from when you lived in London? I know it wasn't for a, a long time. Again, but, you know, um, in the backyard, snowballs, throwing snowballs, <laughs> and, um, playing with the next door neighbours, uh, that sort of thing going to the movies and, you know, walking with my dad, um, um, and, you know, eating ice cream and buying me ice cream, like those kind of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, so in terms of your father's writings, mm -hmm. again, it's your mother that, that, that published that opinions work. Um, when did you start to engage in that literature and those, you know, those writings? Was it through your mum doing that work or was it later in your life that you engaged? How did that come? Well, uh, you know, um, we, we, we always had the philosophy and opinions, you know, uh, at, at home. And there are actually three, three volumes. And my mother has also written on Garvey and Garvey's and uh, herself. She has published her own uh, books. Uh, so that we always had that kind of reading material at home. And then, you know, being brought up basically as, as an African, as a Pan-Africanist, you know, I always consider myself African. You know, an African person who was born in Jamaica, you know, went, went to school in Canada or lived in the United States. But, you know, I'm an African person who's here in Bath. So, um, you know, so that was imbibed, you know, over, over time at home. So that I always pursued the Pan-African literature, et cetera, et cetera, to learn more, you know, about my, 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 my culture and, and my history. So that I was, you know, read stuff like, you know, by Van Serkema, John Henry Clark, Dr. Ben, and so on and so forth. So over the years, you know, that was my, my reading uh, to expand knowledge uh, about Africa, going all the way back, of course, uh, uh, to Kemet, uh, and to Nubia, to Kush, to Ethiopia, and everything in between. So that was my, my area where, you know, I always kept, kept reading. Um, your own career, as a mm. vascular surgeon, medical doctor. Mm -hmm. Tell us how you got on that journey, because that's a, you know. Okay. Well, you know, uh, from a relatively early age, I wanted to be a doctor. I, I think um, I, I had a, a, a dog growing up, and um, I guess we were about 12 or so. He used to go everywhere with me, running, you know, he used to like to run in the bush and so on, and uh, go to the beach and swim. And uh, the dog got sick. And of course, back in the day, um, we had no veterinarian, so what have you. So the dog got sick, and you know we couldn't do anything for the dog. We didn't know what to do. 
So the dog died, you know, so that left a significant impression on me um, in terms of a, an intimate associate who got sick and I couldn't help them. So that moved me in the area of wanting to help sick people. So to speak. Absolutely. And your CV, you know, it took me a day to read, but you've been chief surgeon, professor, you ran your own practice. Um, and, you know, illness is often talked about as a leveller amongst people. But we saw with COVID the inequalities that still exist, even in an illness. So what's your career working in the medical profession, I guess, taught you about people, quality, how we treat each other, and is that also a part of the message that you're also looking to tell us in this talk? Um, and, you know, it's very interesting because, you know, um, obviously we, we, we live in the West and we're influenced by the West. Um, but, you know, as, as we know, in terms of, of reading history, Western civilization is relatively narrow, relatively recent. And our medical tradition, per se, is also relatively recent. And, and it actually comes out of another medical tradition, which is Imhotep, and, you know. Um, it, it, it wasn't the Greek physicians who were prominent, but the first physicians. It was the African physicians who um, were the first physicians, more or less, in the world. And of course, you know, you have the Ayurvedic systems, you have the Chinese systems. You have a lot of plant-based medicines coming out of um, Africa and, and, and the Americas. So the, the system that I grew up in and was taught um, is by and large, I would say, a disease treatment system. It's not a healthcare system, although that's what it's named. Um, it doesn't try to um, uh, prevent ill health you know, because actually the society in which we live causes ill health. Mm. So because the society causes ill health, you have a medical system that treats disease. So it's, it's, it's a strange cycle. And, you know, we are very good at treating disease. We can do lots of things. Um, you know, we can go into all parts of the brain, all parts of the heart, all parts of the lung, all parts of the liver, the pancreas. We can go anywhere and do, we do everything. And so that's, um, 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 well, it's significant in terms of capacity, but it, it's a very mechanical capacity, you know, both in terms of surgery and in terms of the medicines that, that are used. Um, but, but because again, medicines are used that are really treatment of symptoms, um, you know, but then you treat a specific symptom, so you change the milieu, uh, the physiological milieu of, of the body. And the, what you call it side effects. Um, so each, each medicine has a side effect. So if you step back and, and look at it, it, it has many, many problems because it's not dealing with the human body as it's been constituted, because the human body is about health. If you look at disease, um, maybe 3% of disease is really genetically determined. You know, that you're born with a gene that's dominant that causes this disease. 80% uh, of the diseases that we have, you and I have, etc., etc., are, 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 are um, um, you know, um, Lifestyle diseases, basically. That's, that's what they are. And, and when I say lifestyle diseases, they're related to the stress in, in terms of our, our occupations and the way we live. They're related to, to the food, you know, that we that we eat. As you know, you know all about you know high fructose corn syrup, hydrogenated fats. You know all about the processed foods, and you know all about the chemicals that go into the agriculture in terms of the herbicides and the fungicides and this. Now we have genetically modified, or modified organisms. So so the, the, the actual quality of the food is deteriorated, as well as the number of chemicals that are in the food. And um, uh, each of us has more than 100 chemicals uh, in our body that shouldn't be there, and we don't know the long-term effects. So people tell you that dementia and neurological diseases are rising, cancer is rising, and nobody knows why. Right, it's the environment, it's what we do, it's what we eat, it's what puts put into the food, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, um, we, we, we again, um, we have a disease treatment uh, system instead of a system that, that tells you, you know, how to take care of your health. Because ultimately, it's everybody's responsibility to take care of their own health. Because if, if we believe that God made us, he made us healthy. 
as I just mentioned, you know, two, two or three percent of us have genetic diseases where something went wrong, but the rest of us, we have no reason to be unhealthy. We have no reason to have disease except for the environment and our behavior. So, so we have to look to ourselves now to be responsible for our behavior, to gain knowledge about the foods that we should eat and, you know, the things that we should do. And, you know, as you, as you I'm sure you know, uh, but, you know, most of our diseases, if you will, um, relate to our mental status. Um, because if, if you're not controlling um, your, your body um, and, and, and your, your, your lifestyle it itself um, is damaging uh, your body, then, you know, you really have a mental problem. You're not who you're supposed to be because you're supposed to be in charge of yourself mentally and then in charge of your body physically. So, so you have to start with the mind. So um, um, a, a lot of us are mentally incompetent, if you will, because that's the way our society is structured. It's not structured so that we know who we are in terms of our minds, but we're programmed. And we're programmed from the time we're youngsters um, to behave this way and to behave that way. We're programmed in terms of school, programmed in terms of religion, um, you know, university, all along and all along, um, um, to do things that the society says that we should do in you know, order to function and to get along and to be promoted and so on and so forth. So you'll take on a job because you want to get promoted, but it's a job that stresses you out. You know? <laughs> so, you're damaging your health while you're getting the money and you're buying the new car or the Mercedes or what have you. But, you know, so these are things that, um, you know, as individuals, we have to become responsible for our own mental health and then subsequently our physical health. Yeah, no, good. As you're talking, and you know, with that medical knowledge training in that detail, it also brought me full circle to think about Rastafari and how Rastafari went to consider crazy because we didn't put salt on our food and we didn't eat meat, you know, these kind of things. Um, and you know, Tony Sewell wrote that book, Garvey's Children, where he talks about the, the organizations. That were inspired by Marcus Garvey, mm -hmm. particularly Rastafari, and then also the Nation of Islam, and Nation mm -hmm. of Islam, Elijah Muhammad, who wrote the book How to Eat to Live from the yeah. Vegan Lifestyle. So that if you're all vegetarian or vegan, you should never be eating outside mm -hmm. of your house with you know? mm -hmm. Um so it's interesting how you you know your journey through medical, but then mm -hmm. it's still in that teachings and that legacy of Marcus that's come through the children of Rastafari. I think Rastafari need to be congratulated in terms of the act of living, living close to nature. We are a product of nature, so we have to live close to nature. The food that we eat should be natural food, uh, you know, not, not processed food, and, and not necessarily cooked in an elaborate fashion. We destroy a lot of the nutrients and so on, so I tell food, of course, is very, very, very healthy. Yeah. Um, with your father's message in relation to, um, you know, race um, going forward, back to Africa movement, and you know, how do you feel that translates today? And you know, whether an American example or globally, but how do you feel or where do you see that that that, that lesson, that message, and I guess your direction of taking forward that? Well, I think um, you know a, a lot of um, diasporans our understanding the, the need to return uh, to Africa one way or another, uh, you know, mentally or as, as tourists to visit or, or to relocate in terms of immigrants. And of course, the Africans on the continent have recognized that too, that they really, you know, are hampered in terms of progress and going forward without their diaspora and the resources that diaspora brings to the table. As you know, um, I'm gone in, in 2019, conceived of the idea of the year of return. Many other you know, countries have, have really done the same thing, inviting the diaspora to return. And also, as you also know, the, the African Union, uh, the diaspora is supposed to be in the sixth region. So um, we are not well enough organized yet to take advantage of that. But, but that is coming, that is, that is happening in terms of visas and passports and, 
things like that. So, it, as you know, there's been significant uh, uh, progress uh, that the AU has made in, in, in terms of the, the continent bringing uh, the continent together. So it's not as, as divided in terms of um, 55 countries or different regions and so on. So, um, and, you know, everybody else is going to Africa, as you know, but the, the Japanese, um, Chinese. the Turks, the, the, the Chinese, the Lebanese, um, you know, obviously the Americans, the British, the French, uh, the Germans, I mean, so, uh, you know, if we don't go there, I mean, then we're very silly. It's the richest continent in the world, but yet still, you still have the poorest people uh, in the world, in Africa. So, you know, we have to write that situation. We can, um, it's a matter of liberating our minds and, and doing the right thing, which um, I, I think at this point in time, definitely, definitely, many more people are Africa conscious, shall we say, we call it Afrocentric at the present time. And, and many more people are being involved in Africa and, and the, the continent itself is being involved with the diaspora. In September, I was in a conference in Barbados, you're back home, um, between, you know, CARICOM and, and um, uh, several African uh, countries in terms of trade and investment. So um, CARICOM is reaching out to Africa, Africa is reaching out to CARICOM, um, that, and that's just one indication of us as a diaspora. Um, becoming integrated with the continent. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I've got one more question, then we'll open it up to some questions from the floor. Also conscious of times you're going to be travelling back to London this evening. Um, so you also do lots of uh, talking, campaigning, touring about the campaign to pardon your mm -hmm. father and exonerate the charges. Um, he was convicted of mail fraud, trumped up charges. Uh, I'll leave it to you to talk about that. Um, and you've had a campaign to, to mm -hmm. pardon. Barack Obama didn't pardon um, Marcus Masai Garvey, and now the campaign has moved to President Biden. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, but also like, how might we get involved in that campaign to add voice to that? Yeah, basically, um, you know, we've been involved in, in trying to get um, my dad exonerated, certainly at least since 1987, which was the centennial. And um, um, you know, uh, several uh, politicians, um, uh, American politicians, uh, have been involved. John Conyers and so on, Democratic um, uh, con congressman. And um, you know, House resolutions have, have been um, every year uh, have been placed before the Congress, but they usually get stuck in the Judiciary Committee, and then you know, the debate and debate, and then the government changes and ends up as, as nothing happens. Um, so, you know, um, the, the campaign, if you will, changed somewhat in terms of um, trying to get a posthumous pardon, because what a posthumous pardon is, it's something that the president can do without having to go to the Congress. Um, he can simply sit down and say, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm pardoning Marcus Garvey because he was innocent of the charges that were brought against him. So that's the difference between the pardon and the exoneration. The exoneration flat out says that, you know, uh, he's exonerated, again, it's the same thing. But um, as I mentioned, the, the process is very difficult politically uh, in the United States. And um, so that's why we switched in, in 2016. This was Obama's second term. We figured first black president, second term, he has nothing to lose. So, you know, we had a law firm and we presented everything to him, but um, he ignored it and he never did anything about it. So, of course, we didn't petition Trump. Um, so now Biden uh, is in office and we're doing the same thing with uh, Biden. Um, we had a, a campaign, one, a campaign to get, uh, uh, the purpose of the campaign, again, was to, to get the, the president to, um, to, to sign uh, an exoneration or posthumous pardon. And you're supposed to be, have to get over 100,000 signatures within 30 days. We did that this last uh, February. We got over 200,000 signatures, but we got no response from, from uh, Biden. Um, so we've written personal letters to Biden, to Kamala Harris, and so on. My law firm has presented these. And now, um, you know, we're continuing. So that, that's still the struggle that we're on. Is there an online petition? That we can sign. So well, you, you can get more information from uh, the website Justice for Garvey. Justice, <laughs> Justice the number four, Garvey.com. Okay. Okay.
Can I just say some, uh, something on this? Um, last year when we put this out and tried to get a hundred thousand signatures, I was astonished that we couldn't raise a hundred thousand signatures here in the United Kingdom. I was absolutely shocked. And then I remember Dr. Garvey words. Everybody is Garvey, Garvey, Garvey. We can't see him. We're not prepared to do anything. People, I urge you, next time this thing come up, please, let's join hands and get this done. We can do it. All we have to do is to sign that petition. Exoneration for number four, Marcus Garvey. It can't be that too much to ask, is it? Is it people too much to ask? Let me hear you. Is it too much to ask? Yes or no? Thank you very much. So, I want to ask you to thank you, sir, Dr. Julius Garvey. I am going to open up to questions, but I want to also show our appreciation for what you Do you have any questions? Yeah. Do you mind doing the microphone, Julius? Thank you, Dr. Garvey, for coming here to Fairfield House. <clears throat> and we know who Marcus Garvey is in relation to Haile Selassie, but you were born three years into the Emperor's reign. So I would like to know who Haile Selassie is to you and how you feel about when you were younger, how you felt about him and how you feel about his legacy today. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, as a tremendous uh, uh, legacy, in terms of his uh, contributions to the African uh, continent and indeed the diaspora um, dating back to the Organization of African Unity, which he was one of the founders of back in 1963. And of course, um, his tour of the Caribbean in 1966 was significant in terms of his outreach to, to the diaspora. Uh, at that time, he offered land um, also in, in, in Ethiopia. Um, there are many um, Africans there, many diaspora Africans there at Sashimene. So that, um, you know, his legacy is, is significant um, in, in terms of um, not only um, Ethiopian history, but African history and also world history in terms of the fact that Ethiopia itself as a country, you know, it was never colonized, it was occupied for, for a period, partially occupied, shall we say, for, for a period of time, um, but never, never colonized. So, you know, a lot of us are proud of, of that fact. So, um, uh, you know, he, he carried himself with significant dignity. And of course, um, as a historic uh, a person in terms of um, um, uh, his lineage uh, is, of, is of great significance to us because we have, we have lost um, Egypt, which was Kemet, and of course it became Arabized um, uh, after the 7th century of this era. But fortunately, Ethiopia never became Arabized or otherwise um, infiltrated um, by foreigners from outside. So we still have that um, continuing historic legacy you know, dating back to the kingdoms of Kush, etc. So um, it's very significant and we're very, you know, proud of his reign and what he did during his time. Thank you. Greetings. Uh, first of all, I want to say a tremendous thank you uh, to uh, the organizers of this evening's event um, at Fairfield House. Um, brother from the Garvey Legacy, am I correct to say that? Thank you so much uh, for the Rastafari community, the Black Brothers and Sisters and friends of 
Rastafari and being here. It's an extreme honor and pleasure to be in the presence of the son of Marcus Messiah Garvey. And um, as I said, come raining high water, I said I'm trekking here. I'm not going to miss this opportunity. So I really, all I want to do is give thanks and praises because it must have been quite a challenge to, I'm not going to say following the footsteps, to be the son and have that responsibility on your shoulders. So really, all I want to say is thank you, thank you, thank you. I recently watched the film African Redemption, mm. and whilst I think it's a useful thing, as a someone who sees myself as a Garveyite, my major concern was that there was one reference to the great Professor Tony Martin. So again, I'm extremely grateful that you acknowledge that dutiful mastermind who, without him, we wouldn't have. Of course, Amy Jakes Garvey, your mother, is a, a, a tremendous writer in her own right. But we know that Professor Tony Martin has done us a great service in honour of your father, the UNIA, and the African Communities League. I would like to give to you, because one of the things that I take on board that was said by Marcus Garvey in terms of race first, we must stand up on our own two black feet. I've come in the colours of the red, the black, and the green. Uh, and I think all of us, especially in presence of yourself, should be mindful of how important that was to uh, us as people. So I have also crafted a hat. I hope it fits you, Julius. Uh, yes, it's <laughs> cold in, in America. So I would like to give this to you. Uh, and I hope that you will wear it at some point and you will put it on the website and so we can see you with your father's colours because, you know, you are representative of him now. And, um, you know, he did say, look for me all around you for I will return to the world in the colours of the red, black and green. I thank you so much. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that present. And um, but I, I would also like your your T-shirt and your scarf. <laughs> thank you, Andy. Yeah. Wonderful. Address and phone number. <laughs> well, I have to ask everybody to see. Could I just say I was influenced by the teaching so much. I'm a student. Of Professor Tony Martin. My first book is published by Blacks in Science, and the title is A Mixed Jamaican in Multicultural and Racist Britain? Question mark. And I have got a whole chapter in there about African ideology, and of course, I include Black nationalism and Marcus Messiah Garvey. So the book is in there. The book is oh, not for free. <laughs> no, this is another book, but I have oh. my book card in there. Oh, but the yeah. gift of the hat is most certainly yours and the card. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're most yeah, I have a question for you. Can I just underline again how incredibly welcome you are to Bath? Thank you. And, and how blessed we feel in Bath to have this legacy from His Imperial Majesty. My question really is this um, if the Marcus Garvey Foundation takes forward Garveyism, the thoughts and writings of your father, Marcus Garvey, which he set out in the 1920s and 1930s. Do you treat those principles and beliefs as sacrosanct, as written in stone for eternity, or is it an evolving understanding of the role in the world? If that evolves, how do you discern that? How do you decide what the changes are? Well, you know, uh, I think there are certain uh, uh, principles that are eternal. And um, if, you, if you go back to the understanding of, of, of Kemet, um, the basic principles of, 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 of Kemet, which was the first major civilization um, of the world, you know, what, there were antecedents yet, but none achieved the greatness of, of Kemet itself, and certainly not over the period of time that it lasted for more than 3,000 years. You'll find that the, the essential set of principles are what were called ma'at, and those are the principles of, of civilization. And, and they're really principles, you know, relative to truth, you know, harmony, uh, righteousness, uh, justice, and interdependence. And, and, and if, if, if you understand those, those principles, then you can apply them in any circumstances in which you live. 
or over any period of time frame. Um, but the principles stay the same. You know, it's the same way in which you think about values. You know, our values shouldn't be changing every day. Um, your values have to be um, eternal if you really believe that, that you're made in the image of God and God is eternal then your values have to be also eternal. But we live in a society where values change just like skirts go up and skirts go down, or high heels go up and they go down. You know, morals change every day. Nowadays, nobody knows what whose gender is what. I mean, that's somewhat ridiculous, you know, when God made uh, two genders. It doesn't matter what you want to practice, I'm not talking about that, but God only made two genders. Um, it, you know, but people are taking it now, so-called um, liberation. But, but we have to understand that wherever there's freedom, there's also responsibility. And you have to not have a knowledge of self. Self-knowledge is the most important knowledge. And if you don't hear, know yourself, it's not important that you know a, a thousand things and you, you can manipulate a thousand things. And, and this is what Western civilization has done in terms of it's being based on scientific materialism. It knows all about materialism. It can split the atom, etc., etc. But now, of course, after they split the atom and they've gone down uh, to the quantum level, they've found consciousness, and consciousness was always there, and we always know that. You know, another name for consciousness, of course, is God. And that's what we have in terms of our own consciousness. And, um, you know, so it's coming full cycle, and that's why I think this is also a critical time, because I think the Western paradigm is finished. I mean, it's created nothing but chaos. One, two, three. One, two, three. Any other questions? Let's do the... William. Do we have someone to help with the microphone? I know that um, it's nice to hear it from people like myself, but Russia's in particular, I've been referring to your father as a prophet, Marcus Musa Garvey. And I'm absolutely positive that there is Father Expression. I heard of a lot of truth as passed on to you, even though your mom had a daughter and I was like, right? Now, bear in mind, we're living in the, um, the southwest of the country. And we have, um, we have a big city not too far away um, called Bristol. I want to ask a question. Please do not um, be offended. Please answer my question as your father would love him to answer it. I'm saying that. Now, what I need to know is uh, what takes you so long to reach this side of the country and not. Mm -hmm. So, um, to the next thing. <laughs> You can't be everywhere no, 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 no. Now, all the time. Um, but, um, you know, um, I'm happy to be here now. That's all I can say. Um, yeah. we, we tried to go to Bristol too many, but uh, I don't know what happened there. You were trying to make Bristol. But, uh, yeah, but, but we're happy to be here with you, sir. No, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. Just, just the fact that, uh, first time so far. Yeah, I don't know what the arrangements, why the arrangements well, weren't we, made. I didn't we, try. We, we've tried before, you know, and um, believe me, I tried. We tried in 2013. We tried in 2017. And it never happened. And I was determined this time that maybe I should look elsewhere. So I turned to Bath and Bath delivered mm -hmm. uh, because I couldn't do the load. So the people of Bristol was not ready for this. No, we are, no, no, we're getting to the answer that I am yeah. trying to get on. Bath is now. So I need to know first thing first. Bristol has got one of the course, uh, course this connection. To the 
So God, um, I turn on that review sometimes, but it's unfortunate for some, but fortunate for many. But we understand what we're, where we're coming from. Bristol got such a, um, Bristol has got such a cross link with the transatlantic slave trade. And this is why it, it paid me so much. Because I've spent most of my life in Bristol. It paid me so much to know that we have the son of a prophet who are trying to come to Bristol and more than one occasion. And because of constraints, barriers and whatever, and impose, impose upon the church building. That's, that's, that's the question I, I really want to answer. Mm -hmm. And also, um, as I work in Bristol, live in Bristol, but also half living by half and working by um, And what I'm also conscious of is that, you know, we've got a centre here in Fairfield House, which is, you know, international importance, the Rastafari Ethiopian community. The people of Bath, I know from living in Bath and growing up in Bath, we travel to Bristol all the time. Not many people in Bristol also travel out of Bristol, and that habit needs to change. Because actually, what we have in Fairfield House, there's plenty of people in Bristol that never come here. You know, if it is in Bristol, they'd be there all the time. So I think there's also a habit of change in Bristol to know that there's things going on in Bath and to travel out of Bath, which is only 11 miles away. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, and with this particular event, I was also working with, you know, the reason afterwards yeah, that have... in Bristol. But yeah. actually, for this to be a centre of African heritage that's in the city of Bath, this should be full of Bristol people. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I'm not against um, thing keeping in um, bath. No, I would never go against that. You know, because this is that an historical um, link it to us as, um, as a nation. But the question is, if there was a barrier put up to try to um, stop um, positive um, things like this taking place in bath, uh, in Bristol, we need to know. We are um, part of the African Federation here. Yeah. Bridget, I've come know. all the way from London. with the utmost respect, um, Professor Darby, right? it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, it was my um, extreme pleasure to have Sean and the rest of the crew um, that involved in Fairfield House to get it down here. But you, you should understand where I'm coming from. And they, they heard them felt that um, barrier has been put up um, to um, avoid a situation like this happening in Bristol as well. Yes. <laughs> Take one last question. I think that's two, two, two. Oh, okay. Brilliant. Yeah. <coughs> Greetings again, Dr. Garvey. Welcome again. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. We can't see you. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Greetings and welcome again. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Garvey, but considering um, your humble father did so much to encourage the diasporans to return to the motherland, especially the establishment of the Black Star Liner. Is it true that he actually never went to Africa? And if that's the case, do you have any idea why that was the case? That's a mystery to me. Uh, yes, he never went uh, uh, to Africa. But you have to understand, you know. Time in which he lived, this was the colonial period. Mm -hmm. I kept him from going to places like Trinidad and Barbados and, yes, sure. and you know, so let alone Africa. You know about the Liberia project, you should read about that. Yeah. And what happened. Okay, so I had some reading to do that. Yeah, so and you know, even the newspaper, the Negro World, if some people were caught with it in the Francophone territory, um, there was one area where the penalty was death. So again, you have to understand that. Period. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So we got one question there. Ask the board. I was just going to say, 
about teaching in school, uh, of Darwin, how that would be significant for them to, to bring out the, yeah, to, to highlight the Garvey in the schools. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Is there any, is there, I've read on the net, is there any, is there any plans in place for that? Yes, yes. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, Sorry, again, it, it, it shows the, the, the power of the colonial powers and how our mentality is trapped. Because if you look at a country like Jamaica, where, you know, my dad, Marcus Garvey, is the first national hero, um, but he's not being taught in schools. It's not a compulsory subject. So how ludicrous is that? So we are part of a campaign to teach Marcus Garvey in the schools. It's significant groups that are doing that. You know, the government that resolved and says yes, blah, 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 but they don't follow through because it's still the colonial mentality. I mean, how can you have a country or can you run a country when you don't teach the young people about your national heroes? Obviously, they can't be good citizens. So, so when they go astray, then you know you send the police after them. It doesn't make any sense. You have to teach them, you know, who they are, who they should be, and you know how they got where they are. Meaning they have to know their own history and, and know about the people who fought for their freedom. Um, but that's, that has not happened uh, adequately. But so, uh, but we're, we're on it, so to speak. And hopefully, it will happen. So, thank you once again. Just want to thank Dr. Julius Garvey. I want to thank. No, 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 no. Oh, sorry, sorry, Brother Keith Lee. Yeah, I can't wait. I would like to say a few words because uh, I know quite a few Caribbean people came to help us during the Second World War because my family were active participants. We had uh, people from the Caribbean who joined our little small uh, air force and we had uh, medical doctors, I think one or two. I think they were all of them informed and inspired by your father. Mm -hmm. So as the only Ethiopian here, I would like to thank you on behalf of all the Ethiopian community for the for your father. Yeah. <laughs> that and you know certainly a number of our oh, parents etc um you know came over um uh, to fight uh, during the second world war especially on the raf and dr thompson and many of you and you know that and and certainly um um significantly after the second world war the, the politic political change in the, in the caribbean was, was uh, brought about by a number of of, of those um, people who had fought uh, here in, in Britain during the Second World War when they went back home. Again, they were fighting for democracy, so to speak, back home and social change. So, you know, um, we have contributed in terms of the Caribbean community uh, over time, and we're glad to be able to be associated with um, those from Africa uh, as well. So thank you for your, your statement. Close it up now. I want to thank you, Dr. Julius Garvey, for sharing so broadly, so widely, so transparently. Um, and uh, yeah, we've all learned a lot about you in relation to your father, new insights to your father, but also about you as an individual as well. So I just want to again thank you to Dr. Julius Garvey. <laughs> I'm just going to do a prayer that Hany Sassi would have done every morning. About touching who you best you may, you bet you know, Sari, you can dance, men can sleep, and ta, pick what the best you buy, in the on hitch, in the womb, in the deer, to go on your head, in charity, in settings away, but the Dutch in your curve, but then, in young, you have a devil in your curve, and the devil in the womb. Fitina, Akitakaban, Kikifu, Ulu, Adin, Hinji, Menkis, Yantina, Hail, Misakanan, Sel, Alamu, Ah, you know, we should all a safe journey back home. Thank you.